The creative power of limitations. So it began with a bedtime story. My son asked me for something in particular. He wanted a story of a wizard. But not just any wizard. This wizard had to have zero magical powers. Which kind of makes him not a wizard. In a community where everyone is a wizard. Fair enough. I can do it. I had a plan. Then he added a new limitation to it. He wanted a robot. So I had to add robot dragons. Then he added a third piece. It has to have zombies. Because as anyone knows, if there's anything that a great work of literature has, it's zombies. So I didn't have the heart to tell him that this story can't exist. That wizards belong in fantasy, that robots belong in sci-fi, and that zombies belong in action. I just had to craft this story. Make it work. So I didn't know what to do. He had just put three big limitations on the bedtime story he wanted. So naturally, when I don't know what to do, I talk to my wife. And we started planning out this concept of a story. If Wendell, who is a wizard with no magical powers, is going to save the world, what is he going to do? What is his power going to be? If he can't conjure up a word, a world made up of words, he's going to make that world with his hands. So we decided that his greatest weakness, his hugest limitation, would become the source of his strength. That's where he would be creative. So we told the story of Wendell, the world's worst wizard, who, by the way, we made sure the zombies are in there, the robots are in there, but how he saved the world without any magical powers. And we landed on this idea that the real magic was creativity. But it blew up. Suddenly classes were using it as a read aloud. Suddenly we had Wendell tweeting back and forth with classrooms as the protagonist. And as you can see in that picture right there, one class even threw a Wendell themed party. Because up in Canada they don't spend their party time getting ready for standardized tests. Which is what we do. And I think a piece of where the story worked was something my son knew intuitively, which is that creativity happens in the most unlikely places. The magic is all around you, that magic of creativity. There, there is no such thing as creative people. And that limitations are often a source for our creative uh, passion and creative work. But it was mind-blowing for me. Again, figuratively, not literally. Um, because creativity wasn't supposed to look like this. The way this worked is I had a limited audience, three kids, who all wanted a good story and were not afraid to tell me if it wasn't any good. I also had a limited time frame. I better have a chapter ready each night. And I also had a limited process. And that limited process was a combination of fitting things into the narrative story arc, but it was also the process for the first time ever of doing a creative work with another person, which was my wife. And not always having my way in the best way possible. So, I landed on this idea that limitations are oftentimes the source for creative work. See, I'd always believe that create, creativity begins with freedom, space, and opportunity. It's a blank canvas, it's an open space. The creative people are the ones who go out far away and do something different. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes the creative work begins with a blank canvas. Again. But sometimes it's totally different. Sometimes it starts with limitations. 
with being told that that can't be done that way, so you better figure out a new way to do it. I noticed this trend uh, in working with another creative project. My students could not publish globally in a way that was authentic. They could blog with other classes, but it was all schooling. It was something that didn't fit the way actual bloggers blog. And so I wanted something that would be holistic and allow for editing. I wanted customized user groups. And I wanted to have visual writing ideas that would inspire them to write. So I ended up working with uh, three or two other people on something called Writeabout, which is a blogging platform, a digital publishing platform. So this limitation that existed became the source of the creative work. None of us say, hey, you know what we should do? We should make a platform to write on. Instead, we said, we have a problem that we want to fix. And nobody else is fixing it, so we'll do it. In the design cycle, you begin with the defining a problem. And when you start with that problem, you're essentially saying there is a limitation that exists. How do we get around it? And then you move into researching, and then you, you move into this place where you're brainstorming and creating ideas, and you're expanding out, but then you're creating a prototype, which is, is essentially embracing limitations again. The moment you begin making anything, you are limiting yourself in a good way. And then as you test it and revise it, that's truly distilling it and making it better. That's why the best books are tightly written. That's why the best songs are oftentimes only two or three minutes, or if they're classical music, then those are the best ones, and they're like 19 minutes long. But the ones I love are like two or three minutes. So there are things we can do to uh, embrace limitations in order to increase creativity. And the first one is to limit your options. That oftentimes restrictions create freedom. See, I had always believed that thinking outside the box was what it meant to be creative. But now I realize it's more about thinking differently about that box. It's about repurposing the box. Boxes don't suck. Really, they don't. Vacuum soon. But boxes don't. Ever watched a little kid play with a, a box? It becomes an instrument. It becomes a fort, if it's a, a refrigerator box, it becomes a, a vehicle. Boxes are the source of all kinds of creativity with kids. I mean, there's even a video game out right now that's essentially, let's build stuff with blocks. And that's Minecraft. So boxes aren't horrible. It's thinking differently about the box. In other words, sometimes creativity is less about being Picasso and more about being MacGyver. You have this idea in Apollo 13 where they specifically embrace limitations. They have to. It's not a choice. And they take all the items that are out on the table and they say, we've got to get these people back safely. And not a single person in that room says, I'm sorry, we can't be creative right now because we don't have freedom and we don't have opportunities. It's not going to happen. The limitations push them to be creative. And you see people voluntarily embracing limitations. Chefs do this, where they say, we're going to choose five random items. And from that, we're going to create a dish that has never existed before. So you end up with things like bacon-covered cupcakes. You have the same idea in baseball stadiums. For years, they were building the ultimate baseball stadiums, the Astrodome. And it was, it was modern, it was futuristic, and it was built way out in the middle of nowhere. And then suddenly they said, maybe, maybe the limitations that exist will make these baseball stadiums better. So Camden Yards is gorgeous because it is obstructed by a factory and the view of, of the skyline. In our class, we have the same concept that I, by the way, stole from Apollo 13, um, where I, I say we're going to build something in a, in a short amount of time. And sometimes I say, I'm giving you five objects inside of a box, and you have to build blank. You have to build a board game. Go. Boom, you have 45 minutes. Sometimes it's open. Build whatever you want. But in either way, 
in those 45 minutes, kids are incredibly creative. I have never had a student say, I'm sorry, I can't make something because there's too many rules, too many restrictions. Instead, that becomes a chance to be more free in, in their creativity than if I had begun a design project with just designing something. Another thing we can do is limit our work. And this is the idea that sometimes you can do more by doing less. This is the concept of Twitter. Twitter works because you have 140 characters or less. You have to choose your words wisely on Twitter. Or you can tell people what you had for breakfast. Either way, you have 140 characters. It's the idea of Vine, you have six seconds to make your point. You see this in music where some of the best songs limit themselves to two or three minutes. And they limit themselves on what they edit. The sound engineers could add a ton of effects. Everybody could sound like T-Pain, but they don't have to. Because instead, they allow the natural voice to be there. They don't over-edit it. And I think a lot of times kids struggle with this concept of the art of doing less. The art of taking things out. And school isn't designed this way. When I was in school, it was, you have 40 math problems you have to do in this amount of time. We're going to time you. That's how much you have to do. It was about how much you got done. You have a five paragraph essay. You have to do it. It's got to be five paragraphs. What if I could say it more concisely? Too bad. It's five paragraphs. And so students grow up with this idea that part of being creative is just doing a whole lot. And they don't learn the art of taking things out. The art of purposeful limitations. Another thing we can do is limit our schedule. And this is a very uncool idea. But it's that routines and deadlines create spontaneity. That if you see people who do creative work, they are oftentimes incredibly structured with their time. See, I used to believe that this is where epiphanies happen. You go up to the mountaintop, you get clarity, and, and you have this great, amazing epiphany. And then I realized that every time that I actually bothered to climb a mountain, it's pretty rare, and I reached the very top, all I could think about was, this is a place where great ideas are probably happening. Like, I never had great ideas there. But instead, I had great ideas all the time. Well, not all the time, but enough. Some of the best ideas I had came from the times when I was driving or taking a shower. I was in a place of relaxation. I was in a place of routine. That's where the great ideas came from. It's very uncool. It's very like, like oh, we're, what, we're, what inspired you to do blank? You're like, I was driving and there was traffic. And then I just thought, well, maybe, I'll make, maybe we should do a, a publishing platform. That's the origin of that idea. It's the idea that routines and deadlines are what allow you to be prolific. That being prolific is just doing more and staying focused. And that that's a part of creativity. This is why I think it's important that kids learn the art of project management. The more you can manage your time and tasks and break them down, the more you can limit your personal freedom on your creative work, the more creative you end up being. Another idea is that you can limit your audience. And this is the idea that sometimes a limited audience becomes a global audience. I found this out when I was writing the story with my wife. We wrote for three kids and it connected with a bigger audience. Because, see, what happens is if you write for a big, global, huge audience, you don't take risks. You get afraid. You start worrying about what everybody thinks. But if you write something, or create something, or paint something, or make a song for one person, chances are that would be something unique and special, and therefore worth paying attention to. And a bigger audience is attracted to that. This is why in our class, we do the Classroom Arcade Project. And at first, I, I said, this is going to be a big, global, collaborative project. 
We're going to make uh, video games on Scratch, and what's going to happen is uh, we're going to connect with the entire world, and then all together we're going to look at it and uh, and, and, and and you know collaborate. It's going to be amazing. And kids said, "Could we just make it for our, our neighbors?" So we turned the classroom into an arcade. That was the audience. Make it for the 30 kids who are in this room right now. Another one you can do is limit your focus. This is the idea that structure creates clarity. It's the idea that, that when there are rules and structures to something, that actually enables the creativity. I noticed this with ancient poetry. Uh, there was a guy named Jeremiah and his, uh, I was reading this story a long time ago back in college, and I was amazed that his, he was weeping and he wrote this beautiful poetry about the destruction of his town, Jerusalem. And I said, that was the coolest free verse poetry I've ever seen, and then I found out that was actually highly structured. The structure gave him a language to write the poetry. It's the same idea with authors that realize that they have to follow a narrative arc. There's an exposition, inciting, uh, uh, inciting incident, rising action, climax, all of that. That that structure is actually a good thing. It enables and encourages creativity. And it's the idea that the best songs have a bridge and a chorus and verses. That structure is necessary. And it's why when kids make things, beginning with structure isn't a bad thing. Saying, hey, there's a programming language that you could learn. Hey, there's a way to do this. Hey, try this. That structure enables them to be creative. The last point is this idea of personal limitations. Okay? Superman is boring. He is the most boring superhero ever. He can fly. He can see through things. He can see through things while he flies, and yet he never gets in an accident as a result. And he is just a boring superhero. But I contrast that to Daredevil who is limited by his blindness and then saves the world. Or Hell's, uh, Hell's Kitchen? Is that what it's called? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thanks. For, for a second I just was like stuck on hell and then I was like, he didn't save hell. Um, so, it's the idea that, that, that he is one of the most creative superheroes because he doesn't have superpowers. And Bruce Wayne is creative because he uses gadgets in creative ways. But Superman doesn't have to, never has to be creative. Because he has no personal limitations that allow him to, to be creative. And this is because you find a way to do things differently when you're faced with personal limitations. And that's not always true. I don't want to be flippant about personal limitations. The truth is it's really hard to face personal limitations. But I see this all the time with my students. We're low income, mostly ELL. Kids come in not speaking English. And yet, because they learn the language differently, they see the language differently. And when I see some of what they've written, when they come back in college, when I have a student who says, hey, I'm an English teacher now, and I'm a writer, check this out. And I remember when that student came to America only speaking Spanish. It's like magic. That limitation allowed them to appreciate the language and therefore speak it in a way that no one else is doing. It pushed them to be creative. And that's the idea. There are times where freedom and choice and all of that are necessary for creativity. But sometimes the source of creativity is a limitation.